This film was made possible in part by the Montana Wilderness Association, the Idaho Humanities Council, and the Montana chapter of the Society of American Foresters. Late in December of 1935, 17-year-old Bud Moore assembled a load of equipment at the trailhead for Lolo Pass on the border between Idaho and Montana. That was all wilderness country then, and he was about to spend the winter there trapping furs. It was the start of a long career working in and for the national forests, and the start of a love affair with wild lands and natural processes that would stay with him the rest of his life. Bud Moore was part of most of the key events in the history of conservation and public land management during the 20th century. When he retired from the Forest Service, he built himself some cabins near Condon, Montana, went back to logging and trapping furs, and shared his unique perspectives in teaching and in writing. You could always find a cup of coffee and a good story at Bud's place. He had a vivid memory and he also kept a diary, daily when he worked for the Forest Service, but regularly until the end of his life. This gave him a great sense of history and of his own place in history. I'm a creature of wilderness. That's where I grew up. I grew up, I trapped furs in the wilderness, put my life together working for the Forest Service in the summer. I lived right there with all this stuff. I grew up on a homestead in the low, low fork of the Bitterroot there, right slam bang against the road ends. And there was that great piece of country across the Clearwater, the Locksaw. Which was pretty much all wild and from our place, clear through to settlements on the other side of the mountains. We were brought into um, young manhood pretty doggone fast. At about age 12, I was crossing the Bitterroot Range and over onto the Idaho side quite frequently. I went to the Woodman School, which was a one-room schoolhouse, and I went there six years. And during that time, I made it through eighth grades. One of my prized possessions was a letter written to me uh, later from a school teacher, and she asked me if I was Robert. That's what they called me then. She said, are you the little boy that came to school and the first day went up to the blackboard and announced that he could write and printed the word Winchester on the blackboard? Woodman School was established in 1892. We're sitting in the computer lab at Woodman School right now, which used to be the one-room schoolhouse that Bud attended in 1924 to 1931. Woodman was first built in 1892 for the Woodman children. All five of them went to school in the original. This film was made possible in part by the Montana Wilderness Association, the Idaho Humanities Council, and the Montana chapter of the Society of American Foresters. Late in December of 1935, 17-year-old Bud Moore assembled a load of equipment at the trailhead for Lolo Pass on the border between Idaho and Montana. That was all wilderness country then, and he was about to spend the winter there trapping furs. It was the start of a long career working in and for the national forests and the start of a love affair with wild lands and natural processes 
that would stay with him the rest of his life. Bud Moore was part of most of the key events in the history of conservation and public land management during the 20th century. When he retired from the Forest Service, he built himself some cabins near Condon, Montana, went back to logging and trapping furs, and shared his unique perspectives in teaching and in writing. You could always find a cup of coffee and a good story at Bud's place. He had a vivid memory and he also kept a diary, daily when he worked for the Forest Service, but regularly until the end of his life. This gave him a great sense of history and of his own place in history. I'm a creature of wilderness. That's where I grew up. I grew up, I trapped furs in the wilderness, put my life together working for the Forest Service in the summer. I lived right there with all this stuff. I grew up on a homestead in the low, low fork of the bitter root there, right slam bang against the road ends. And there was that great piece of country across the Clearwater, the Locksaw, which was pretty much all wild from our place, clear through to settlements on the other side of the mountains. We were brought into um, young manhood pretty doggone fast. At about age 12, I was crossing the Bitterroot Range and over onto the Idaho side quite frequently. I went to the Woodman School, which was a one-room schoolhouse, and I went there six years. And during that time, I made it through eighth grades. One of my prized possessions was a letter written to me uh, later from a school teacher, and she asked me if I was Robert. That's what they called me then. She said, are you the little boy that came to school and the first day went up to the blackboard and announced that he could write and printed the word Winchester on the blackboard? Woodman School was established in 1892. We're sitting in the computer lab at Woodman School right now, which used to be the one-room schoolhouse that Bud attended in 1924 to 1931. Woodman was first built in 1892 for the Woodman children. All five of them went to school in the original schoolhouse, burnt down in 1902, and the one Bud got to go to was built in 1903. Bud started at the age of seven in 1924 and graduated in 1931 at the age of 13 and finished up eight grades of school in six years. Well, he's very proud of that. The school itself has had enrollment that's run anywhere from 5 to 80 kids over the years and is still going strong up low, low Creek. <laughs> but said he always wanted to walk that trip back to school. And unfortunately, with his passing and unable to do that, the students decided that they would start to dedicate a walk every year for the five miles that it took Bud from one of the sites where he lived up the creek here. And so every year in the spring, we do the five mile walk. And it's a marvel to us how they ever made it to school on time. We got in contact a lot there with the mountain men. Not so much the Forest Service right away, although we were in with them pretty soon. They all had pack trains, you know. That's about the only way they could carry gear way back. And we wintered some of their stock, and they'd stop at our place and visit. And I listened to all the stories of those old guys about this country over the hill. I had a great feeling of wanting to go over into that great wild country. My first job with the Forest Service was in 1934. That was a 
a bad fire year and the fires everywhere. And I fought fires there in the Lolo Creek drainage and up around the Montana-Idaho state line. The firefighter pay was 35 cents an hour, I remember that. So that was, that was big money because we didn't have much cash, you know. So that was my start. The next summer, Bud got his first seasonal job with the Forest Service. Ed McKay, a ranger, legendary ranger from Powell, he come along with another guy in the truck. They're heading over into the Locksaw. By that time, the roads had penetrated down to, to Powell Ranger Station. So he asked me if I wanted a job, and I said, sure. And so he said, on June 4th, you'd be out here at a certain time on the road. The truck would be coming through and bring your gear, told me what to bring. So that was when I went to work as a seasonal employee. There wasn't any professional foresters then. Those guys were just flat good woodsmen. They picked them really on the basis of their woodsmanship skills. They had to be able to shoot, pack, supervise people, do rudimentary surveying, all that sort of thing, and take care of themselves in the mountains with, you know, with pack stock or whatever, hiking, whatever they do. That's the type of people they were. Norman McLean claimed that they hired the guy that could whip everybody else in the valley. And to some extent that was true, but I know it wasn't all true because they hired me and I couldn't whip everybody in the valley. I know that. <laughs> I was 17 when I went to work in 1935. And geez, I was a kid to the outfit. And that, that wasn't an easy break-in because everybody else on that Powell district practically was a real seasoned woodman. But I was pretty seasoned, even at 17, because I'd lived out there in the mountains a lot. I did mostly trail and telephone line maintenance. You know, we hung those grounded lines through the forest. Big rush to be ready when the fire started popping up. And then as soon as the fire danger got bad, then we went to our positions, either fire guard or fire lookout. I spent several years as a fire lookout. When a fire showed, the nearest person went to the fire. If you were on a lookout, you were paid lookout smoke chaser wages, but if you were the first one, or one could get there quickest, they dispatch you, and then they dispatch a support up. Maybe the support would have to hike from the ranger station. The genesis of the lookout program really was driven by the 1910 fires. After 1910, all the destruction in the Northwest, Idaho, Montana, other areas, the Forest Service decided that detection and the preventing of fires by fast action and finding them was what they wanted to do. Things progressed from that to actual buildings that were put on the mountaintops. At the height of the lookout era in the late 1940s, early 1950s, there were 8,000 lookouts all over the United States. The lookouts did a terrific job, but the feeling at the time was that air patrol flights could cover a lot more country and see a lot more than the lookout themselves could went from any one position. But we've discovered over the years that having a person on a mountaintop in a fixed position is really better than an air patrol flight because the flight only overflies an area for a short period of time. A lookout is viewing constantly and is more likely to see a fire when it starts than an airplane which just randomly comes through the area and might or might not find the fire. Some people have said that lookouts can be replaced by a camera on a mountaintop but photos still need to be interpreted and, in my opinion, there's just no substitute for a well-trained observer on the mountaintop. Growing up literally in the footsteps of Lewis and Clark, among men who still made their living as hunters and trappers, Bud soon learned to do those things too. You have to go back in the woods. That's the only way you can understand the, uh, the whole thing of what's going on. My dad was a fur trapper. Uh, that was the way he got most of his cash in the wintertime. He trapped furs in the Bitterroot Mountain just from our homestead. And then I followed him when I got big enough to take over the trapping and the hunting for the family. 
I was trapping the Lolo Creek during the up around Lolo Peak and the South Fork of Lolo Creek when they came down for Christmas. And I met the Orrin Van Hoos down to our place. He'd just come out from having the, having the fire in the Wendover Creek to burn his cabin. And they accidentally burnt down the, the old cabin. And that's when I bought the trap line sight on the scene. I packed out of the mountains after a year's trapping, and uh, I bought this heavy pickup, brand new, and I paid $640 for this <laughs> this pickup. Drove it right out of the showroom, brand new. I made good money in the Depression years when you compared to how hard the times were. Most of my friends didn't even have work in the winter. They'd work in for the Forest Service, and then they'd come out and they might just work somewhere, maybe at some ranch or something for their board. You know, it was that sort of thing. But this time in my life, I wasn't home very much. I'd just come out, sell for her, stay a few days, maybe go over to Butte and play with some relatives, and then go right back in the mountains again, go over and, and clean up my cabin, spear a few steelhead, and, and make my scent for next trapping here. This is deep snow country here. 10, 12 feet of snow is not uncommon in the winter. And you're going from cabin to cabin. And uh, those cabins are pretty small and they get pretty darn warm when you build a fire in the stove. And so the common practice was to bring your fur out and hang it under the porch. You'd have dried fur, you know, you'd been going around skinning and stretching, and uh, so you'd bring your fur out and hang it out where it's cold. Most of the cabins, for trapping purposes, they extended out of a nice cool place to hang your fur while you were inside sweating and cooking. I usually came out at Christmas time and sold the mink, if I had a good mink catch, because their best value was around the end of the year. And then it was pretty important to come out in time to get these long-haired furs on the April fur auctions because the fur kept rising up in marketability until the April sale. Then the prices would drop. Usually, after I got my furs sold, we'd just play for a week or so. And then I'd come back into the lock saw <laughs> again. I didn't think I'd ever leave that, you know. Trapping introduced Bud to some of his earliest ideas about sustainability. And these people wanted to trap forever, and they understood that you had to conserve some of your breeding stock and all that. You couldn't hit it too hard. So there were two uh, basic conservation practices. One was some of the trappers trapped two different mountain ranges. For example, Wes Fales out of Hamilton, he would trap one winter in the Locksaw and the next winter in the Sapphire Mountain. And then the other principle was to lay out your lines in a great circle through your trapping country and then never spur line inside this circle. The rationale being that if the fur bear didn't come out of this big circle, then he was your breeding stock for another year. Bud was on his own a lot in the 1930s, living in small trapper cabins during the winter and manning his fire lookout in the summer. All the lookouts, you know, they were wrapped up to get the fire first. And a promotion or two would, might come with that. I didn't have much luck on McConnell Mountain because most of the other lookouts had these developed towers and they could sit right there and watch the storm. But in my place, I lived in a cabin off down a little ways. And I had to scoot down there during the lightning storm. I couldn't be up on the peak or I'd get clobbered. So I got to thinking about that, and one day I decided to build myself a little cabin. By the way, that little cabin, I think, is a National Historic Place now. But I built this thing, and I never asked any permission. But one day the ranger come up, and God, he'd seen this structure from a long ways away. And he didn't even bother to say hello, he run right out there. Then he come back and he said, hey, that's a pretty good idea. Next trip up with a packer, I'll send you some lightning protection for that. Bud's energy and initiative were starting to get him noticed. But he was still the kid of the outfit. 
I got that thing all hooked up, but I didn't have any windows yet. You know, it was just open. And here come a big storm in from the crags, just pounding away. And all at once, there was a big flash. I got it just like that, and I couldn't see. I opened my eyes just wide as I could, but when I got where I could see, why here was a fire burning in a snag about 50 feet away. So I thought, well, I'll get a first discovery. So I, I turned around, started to the phone, and the phone rang, and Bear Mountain had already got it. He's, he, this, I'm right on top of this peak, and of course everybody in the world could see it. And so I couldn't move fast enough to get a first discovery on that one. By 1941, Bud was a full-time Forest Service man, newly married and with a career shaping up in front of him. Life was pretty good in the woods. The world outside, though, was about to intervene. After the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, all the able-bodied men had to take their exams and be prepared to go. So we all did that. When I did it, though, I just had an operation on my, my hand. My hand went dead, and I, and I got a 4F classification. We found out, though, a little later, that uh, it was a misplaced vertebrae that had pinched the nerve. And when I got that fixed, his hand come back. But that all created a little delay. The Japanese had overrun a lot of our rubber supplies in the Pacific. And we didn't have any synthetic rubber. So the government sent a gang of us down there to California and, and the related states to raise that Waiuli rubber we took over all that bean land and started planting Waiuli rubber. That was a six months detail, and then they extended my detail two more months. I had a pretty good show going, and it was right along in the front of Camp Pendleton. Synthetics took hold so fast that I don't think they run that Waiuli more in a couple of years. But they did manufacture quite a bit of rubber there at Salinas, because as I recall, the early synthetic tires, you had to have a certain amount of natural rubber in them also. While I was down in Southern California, I kind of got the marine fever. I, I talked to a lot of those Marines, you know, they were, they were training in that big Camp Pendleton base. So I thought when I get home, I'm gonna try for the Marines. By that time, my hand was healing up. It, still, it never did come clear back. So that's what I did. The war hit me at uh, about 22 or 23 years old, which was old. I remember when I got in the Marine Corps, I immediately, I wasn't Bud anymore, I was Pop. There wasn't any doubt in our mind what we were going to do. Jane would uh, have to stay, take care of the home front. We didn't have any children at that time. I wanted to get in the scout snipers, but that was already full up. I went overseas as a machine gunner in the infantry. Guadalcanal was pretty well all cleaned up. They won that one while I was running around planting Guayuli. Cape Gloucester was where I first went into combat. Kind of a drawn out, long range thing in the densest jungle you could ever imagine. They had about a two week season they called the sun season. And all the rest of the time it was rain. So in addition to the fighting there, everything with wheels on it bogged down in the mud and it was real nasty stuff. We got ashore pretty good, but your first morning somebody gets shot. You'd be going down with single file, you know. It was a sniper's paradise. When we'd hit some resistance, then we'd spread out, of course. And then we'd call in the bombers and they'd drop right close to us, but in front of us. They were pretty darn accurate. In the Marine Corps, it's the riflemen that contact the enemy first, almost always. And then they'd call a machine gun, and then you come up and shoot the hell out of whatever the target is, just eat it up, and then pick up and go, get out of there, because a machine gun gives you away. You know, as soon as you start one of those, it's pretty easy for an enemy to figure out where you're at. You're making a hell of a lot of racket and there's a tracer going out once in a while. And when you're in an area like that, 
the enemy knows it so well that they got it all coordinated. You will just plow the ground where you're at, so you get it fast and move out fast. That's what I was doing on my first beachhead. I think the thing that worried me most was the unknown about what was going to happen on this first time and whether I could take it or not. I knew how to do it, but just, yeah, you know, what I hold together. Bud did more than just hold together. He was in some of the worst fighting of the Pacific Theater. On Peleliu, over 70% of his outfit were either killed or wounded, including him. Peleliu was probably the toughest that I was on, I think. I happened to be on the same ship as Chesty Puller, our regimental commander. He's probably one of the most famous of all Marines. And I remember his briefing. He said, we don't want any prisoners. Kill all the yellow bastards. The generation of a, a whale of a lot of hatred reduces your feelings about the enemy turned zilch. The least uh, sensibility they got for other people, the better marine they are if you're at war. I had become the acting first sergeant of the company on this one. It was a matter of elimination. We hit the beach under pretty heavy fire. After a bombardment, you'll see the enemy begins to come alive again. Gets up and shakes off the dust and looks around and sees if he's got something to shoot with. He gets it set up and he starts shooting. The third wave is where you really get taken because by that time anybody that's alive there is up and shooting again. And I was on that third wave that time. So, gosh, we didn't hardly get on the beach till Captain Dodwin blew his leg off. Coral Ridge in there, that's where most of it was coming from. The Japanese pretty well left that flat country on the beach, climbed up into all their caves and holes. There was lots of action up there. Lots of Marines lost their lives here. A lot of them went home, shot up in bad shape too. Again, I was lucky. I didn't get anything but uh, shrapnel. The one beneficial thing that I got out of the whole adventure of World War II was how many times my life depended on some little feather merchant, that's a term for short marine, from the Bronx or somewhere, was a guy that saved my hide. I come out of there realizing that, gosh, you know, every place you go, there's good people everywhere. I began to get a broader vision than I had when I was dealing just with grizzly bears and martin trappers and farmers and ranchers. In the democracy, Lord, you can't get away with that marine stuff. You know, you gotta, you gotta have a court the will of the people in everything you do. Bud returned to the Forest Service after the war. And being close to nature again was an important part of his readjustment to civilian life. The healing powers of nature have been recognized for many centuries, going back as far as 2000 BC in Mesopotamia. In France in the 12th century, one of the priests spoke of a hospice hospital that had plants and fragrances that helped the patients undergo the problems they were dealing with in death and dying. In the VA system, what they were doing from World War I to World War II was raising the food and feeding the animals as part of their psychiatric therapy. The greater the immersion, the better the effect, as measured by blood pressure, pulse, and electrodermal activity. In Japan, researchers are investigating excursions into the woods for several hours. And what they found is that a chemical in the blood which is involved in cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and other disorders decreases with their time in the forest. Also, they find that exposure to some of the wood oils has a beneficial effect. 
Today, my interest is trying to keep our veterans out of nursing homes, and that means keeping their brain as functional as possible. And that's what we're involved in right now, is we're involved in validating how nature heals. In 1949, Bud was promoted to District Ranger for the Powell Ranger District, back in the Locksaw country where he had grown up. The Ranger District job was by far the best. That's where real home was, as far as the Forest Service to me. The idea of having a big ranch, you know, where you're in charge of this place. You're working for the public, and they expect you to take care of it, good care of it. Can't get much better job than that. Give us your opinion of what ought to be in those woods. That's what I thought I was a ranger for. And I didn't mind getting slapped down because I could separate what was good for the ecosystem with the politics of the time. I didn't always win, I didn't expect to. But one thing I wanted to be sure of is that I'm ready to tell you what this tract of land, in my view, as a manager of it, is the best way to go for it. And, uh, and number one, it's a respect for natural processes and we're going to keep it sustainable and ecologically intact. The district ranger's job in the Forest Service probably hasn't changed a lot from the time that the Forest Service was established until now from the standpoint of what the job is. They're dealing with the public, they're dealing with the users of that ranger district, they're supervising the staff, they're taking care of forest fires, they're taking care of grazing if that's taking place. Their job is to make sure that the trails are being maintained, that the signs look good, and all the business management kinds of things that go along with that too, such as human resources and accounting and those kinds of things. When I was there, it was what we refer to as a remote ranger district. And uh, it was 50 miles to the nearest town. We had our own one-room schoolhouse on the ranger station. We got a lot of snow, four to six feet of snow on the ground during the winter time. Uh, sometimes we couldn't get in and out of the ranger station because of avalanches along the highway. It was a, a place where people worked together in a real unique way. You had to either learn how to work together or it was going to be a very miserable place to be. A lot of people think that the district ranger doesn't have that same kind of authority anymore because things are more centralized. You're going to often get a lot more advice than you maybe than you want. But the job is managing that ranger district, that chunk of land, and making the decisions that deal with that chunk of land. Bud's broader vision after the war included a much stronger awareness of what would come to be called land ethics. But the Forest Service was still focused on trees as a crop. After the war, there was a tremendous boom for timber, you know. And the valley bottoms, that was all logged out pretty soon and we began to look at the national forest and figured out uh, allowable cuts and so on. What could we do on the national forest? I think that started with Gifford Pincho. Pincho's philosophy was the Forest Service philosophy for quite a long time. I think the roots of that are way back there. Commercial timber first, pretty much. Our first forester that was there in the you know, Department of Interior publicly stated all the time that the forests are not an object of uh, recreation or beauty. They are strictly an object of economics. In the 1950s, timber harvesting reached an all-time high. And it seemed as if the cut could go on forever. Where we made our mistakes in the past wasn't so much a lack of knowledge. It was an illusion of knowledge. We thought we knew a whole lot more about the, the thing, this national forest we were trying to manage than we really knew, and we went ahead full bore. That's the old manifest destiny thing. That was strong for a long time. Anything get in your way, run over it. We got to do it. We were promising what, 40 some million board feet a year sustainably out of the lock saw. And they kept that up for a while, but finally it dropped off to seven million. Well, that was the kind of thing that began to shake us up, you know. Sustained yield, we haven't, we haven't done real well with that uh, over the years. Even though we thought at the time we were doing the right kinds of things. 
somehow or another it didn't co come out again and again, especially in these western mountains, like uh, we thought it would. And I'm not apologizing for what, what I did and what many others did, because we did the best we could given the knowledge of the time. It's easy to look back now. I can look back and say, golly, bud, well, you, you messed up there. But uh, I didn't know I was messing up then. Bud loved being a ranger at Powell, but when 13 firefighters died in a wildfire in Man Gulch on the Helena National Forest, he was drawn, once again, into a bigger world. We had something to learn from that. We had never had those escape fires. It wasn't even part of the train. The train was more focused on how to put the fire out. And it, it, made, it made a lot of difference in my life because the chief convened a task force to study these um, tragedy fires. And I was a member of that task force. There was a ranger delegation. Overnight, I was a fire expert. I didn't uh, quite feel that way, but but I went back to Washington. That was my first assignment in Washington. We made a lot of recommendations on that task force, and then, having participated in it, I became a, a draw all over. Not just home, but I was everywhere for a while, trying to help people put on training programs. It got to where I just couldn't do my job on the Lolo. So then uh, it was decided uh, I'd transfer over to fire control, and there I could focus on this thing. It made a big difference in what I did with my life. One of the task force recommendations was to establish a set of standard firefighting orders, which have been in effect ever since. And so the district ranger with an eighth grade formal education now worked in the highest ranks of the Forest Service. You look back over your life, it's all a, somewhat of a learning curve. You start from you know, some given point and you, and you learn all the way through. You hope you do, because if you don't, you're going to start <laughs> going down, you know. But uh, I think my learning curve opened up quite a bit when uh, I went to Washington. I went there as director of training. And training people were mostly in fire in those days. We didn't have much training in personnel. This was office work in the big city during the week. On the weekends, though, there was plenty of new country to explore. Being Bud, he found some new country to explore downtown, too. I had uh, figured the Forest Service out pretty well that uh, one of the most lucrative places to work was in the jobs nobody else really wanted. Everybody wants to be a forest supervisor. Well, I'd look at the line of guys that's lined up to, to be the flathead forest supervisor or something and think, no, Bud, you'll never make it. Let's take on something. Let's still stop and wait. The Defense Department had done a lot of research, and they knew that there was a lot of fire if we ever had an attack. They'd already recognized the, the nuclear fallout and had shelters planted all over for people to go in, but they didn't quite know how to apply or what to do or what not to do with all this fire data. So um, I grabbed this thing, they paid, paid good money, it was kind of an operational research project, is what it was. It'd take all that data, make some sense out of it. And for the first time there, we began to use computer analysis. That was a highly classified thing. And when we finished that project, then I went into the Division of Fire Control as Deputy Director. If Bud had his doubts before about being a fire expert, they were gone now and his work with the old-time rangers, combined with his concerns about forest ecology, put him in a perfect position to make a major contribution to fire science. I knew that we'd probably improved the shovel about all we could. We reduced the fire occurrence, and fire spread way down over the years, compared to that million acres it used to burn regularly. 
So it seemed to me like a little fuel modification, things like that. That would be a better way to put our money. So I got to thinking about the old days and the old rangers that I'd worked for. We had so little capability. The fire was small, they just couldn't get it. So what they do, they start going around sizing it up and saying, well, geez, that's old junk over there, it's half bug killed, uh, let it should burn anyhow. But this over here, we got a young forest, half of the fire here 20 years ago, we don't want this to burn. So we began to figure out what to lose and what to keep. That got me kind of into this fire effects, the good side, the bad side. There is a good side to fire. A little earlier than the Forest Service, there was a guy named Bruce Kilgore. He was in the Park Service, and he was the pivot man in the Park Service. I became the pivot man in the Forest Service for trying to turn this thing around from strict fire control to managing fire. Then when I got a chance to transfer out of Washington back here to Region 1, that was one of the big policy things that I wanted to tackle to try and see if we could do something better than just killing fires. My boss uh, in Washington, Merle Loudon at the time, he was an old firefighter, you know, and he didn't exactly buy on to what I was trying to do, but by golly, he had enough faith so that he appropriated us a little money to try this. In the regional office, when I began to discuss this quite a bit, I found great reception. The only place I was running into a little bit of trouble was in my own organization, where we had a lot of people who'd spent their whole careers in fire. But nonetheless, we went ahead with that policy. We set up a test area up in the white cap drainage of the Selway, did a good fuel survey in there, and then we started to allow the fires to burn under some kind of surveillance. The reason we set it up in the wilderness was primarily because we didn't have any objectives outside the wilderness. We were just using the country. The law set real clear objectives because it says that nature is to prevail there and the hand of man will be substantially unnoticeable, things like that, which pretty much said that to put out fires is almost against the law. That's why we chose wilderness. And then one other reason we chose is because back there we had some elbow room. If a fire escaped, it wasn't going to burn up some ranch or town or whatever. Certainly the biggest natural force in the wilderness is natural fire in terms of, of uh, managing the ecosystem. We used to think that we would have a, a significant fire year about every other year, and then it seemed like we were going to have a significant fire year about every year. But all of those fires that were allowed to burn really mitigated the next fires, the future fires. So by the time 2000 rolled around, almost every fire that started naturally that was allowed to burn ran into another fire from previous years and was mitigated by that. And that might lead somebody to conclude there's not a, not a green stick of timber left in the cellway, which is not true because fires have a tremendous amount of variety in the way they burn. One of the major forces that led to the, the wildernesses that we cherish today. But mid-July you say, we're gonna allow this fire to burn. You're gonna live with that decision every day, every night. You're gonna to go to bed with it. You're gonna wake up with it until mother nature decides it's done. And that's a harder thing to do. And it's especially hard to do if it's the first time. And so I think we need to find a way to mentor and support those newer decision makers. You know, and still in them, if we could, some of that spirit that Bud did for so many of us. The big fire challenge is, as I see it, sure, we don't want to burn up towns like Los Alamos down there and the Sealy Lake, Montana. We don't need to. We ought to start around those towns and work the forest back and make them defensible. You can't make them fireproof, but you can make them defensible. And then as we get further away, we can go back to ecosystem management to consider all the values. And there's some values even in this brush that's grown up since we put out all the fires. We were closer to managing ecosystems way back in the time when the early day rangers uh, came, came in. Because those uh, guys lived in the forest. They stayed there year round and they felt and understood 
a lot more of the linkages than we did later on. But the Forest Service began to grow, especially after World War II. There was lots of growth then. They began to specialize more. You know, the whole society did that. Just take, um, for example, the medical profession. Well, you go back around the turn of the century, practically everybody was a general practitioner. Now you can't hardly find a general practitioner because the rewards were all in specialties. We've got specialties now for ears, eyes, nose, feet, toes. We just all split up in parts. And so we organized, the Forest Service has organized the files, the organization. There's chiefs of timber, range, water, and all of this, but there's no chief of the land. And that's why a lot of those things didn't work, because we lost the connectivity between them. And that's what you can see out on the land. It's not easy to see, but it, but it can be done. You can see how all these all connect. I think that's the challenge of the Forest Service particularly, to work the forest in a holistic way and um, make it pay if they can and get the stuff out of it that the people need from the National Forest, both amenities and commercial, and, and uh, that's a big challenge. The 1960s began a new era of environmental awareness that would have profound impacts on the way Americans thought about their relationship to the natural world. DDT, that was part of the culture. And that come out of World War II, and uh, gee, we were spraying everywhere. They were spraying with hand sprayers and all kinds of things, marketing that stuff all over, until Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring. That was the beginning of the turning. Rachel laid out a stumbling block there, and her studies in science held real good. And so we've come a long way since Rachel, thanks be for her. The major lesson I got out of that was, if in doubt, go slow. But the Forest Service, we're just an expression of part of the society. And if society's going that way and we all kind of believe in what we're doing, why well, we're going to go that way. Now, we have seen that in the wilderness movement. You know, people laid down in front of bulldozers and things to get attention and eventually worked it out. There was a big rebellion when I came back from Washington against uh, some of the practices of the Forest Service. That blew up in three places around the nation. Uh, one was uh, the Monongahela in West Virginia. The other was the Bitterroot National Forest and the other was down on the Wind River country. The better route, the big thing was that terracing. They were terracing with bulldozers, just building roads about 30, 40 feet apart around the mountain and planting trees in these roads on some of these slopes. And of course, they can get trees that way. But geez, the people wouldn't settle for tearing down a mountain to get the trees to grow. From all that, came the, the, a whole host of laws in the next uh, years. The National Forest Management Act come into play, the National Forest Planning Act, the uh, Environmental Policy Act, all happened right there in the 80s in a fairly short period of time. There was a lot of momentum. And that was the, the beginning, I think, of kind of a massive mistrust for the Forest Service. That's when we lost the white hat sort of thing. The public never questioned us until then. And it's a, it's a good thing they did. A lot of good came out of that, there's no question. Bud Moore's career with the Forest Service began in the 1930s, and during that time, the agency really was in a custodial management frame of mind. Basically, times were relatively tame and quiet. That began to change when timber and other resources were necessary to support the war effort and then accelerated with the baby boom generation coming on board, a housing shortage in the aftermath of the war, and for decades the Forest Service, the BLM, have been pursuing a multiple use management agenda which basically meant commodity production. But this combination of changing laws, changing social economic forces, new scientific information, all ultimately culminated in the agencies beginning to take account of environmental values. One of the dimensions of ecological management that has become increasingly important is fire management. 
by the 1960s and 1970s, science was beginning to question whether putting out all fires was a good resource management policy, recognizing that fire was an important process within the western forest to enable the landscape to evolve more naturally. And of course, Bud Moore was an important pioneer in this process, and ever since the mid to late 1970s, all of the federal land management agencies have had policies that allow wildfires to burn, at least in backcountry locations. And in my view, the federal agencies are now entering into a new era of ecological management, taking account of all of the resources found on the landscape. Bud retired from the Forest Service in 1974, but he never retired from the forest. In the Swan Valley, he went back to logging again for another 20 years. And he did it in his own way. My heart is really in these woods you see here. And we are trying to walk the talk in our land management practices, which we're calling ecosystem management today. We're right about in the middle of an 80-acre tract that uh, we own here in the Swan. It takes about 15,000 board feet to pay uh, the basic fixed costs on a little operation like this. This is a one board foot right here, 12 inches square all the way around and one inch thick. We're disciplined here by economics. We really can't afford to hold on to our land without getting something back from it. We saw natural window frames, and we saw fireplace mantles with the bark on both sides, you know, that sort of thing. So there's quite a bit of specialty products involved, as well as the lumber that you see here on the rack. We don't saw here in the winter time, but a big year would be, say, 40 or 50,000 board feet a year that we'd uh, put through this little mill. It's interesting to work here and demonstrate to our neighbors and our government and to the universities around. And we do do quite a bit of that. Demonstrate that it is possible to have a nice forest and still take some sustenance from it. Bud did not have a college degree, although he was a scholar of the land and the forest, and shortly after he retired from his long Forest Service career, he started working with students at the University of Montana's Wilderness Institute. He was one of the founding board members, and one of the crowning moments of working with students was that he actually did get his honorary Ph.D. For many years, I taught a course for the Wilderness Institute called the Winter Wilderness Field Studies, and I would bring students up to the Swan Valley for two weeks. Some of these students come from big city areas and have never experienced what it's like to split a piece of firewood. How do you stay warm in the winter? And so Bud would use his good sense of humor and his patience and demonstrate to the students how to split a piece of firewood. And then he said, okay, it's your turn now. Those are the kinds of hands-on experiences that students remember. He was a natural educator and the students were just captivated by his many stories and of course then we would walk down to the bear tree and he would tell the story and show us the bear claw marks high up on the tree and the students would be just mesmerized and at the end of the course the students would fill out evaluations and talk about the highlights and the, the greatest parts of the course. Bud's time with the students up here at Coyote Forest was always one of the highlights. Bud started running trap lines again, too. It's quite likely that I wouldn't go trap for recreation, but I enjoy and appreciate the harvest part of this thing. Well, you need something, you maybe uh, need uh, some meat or whatever it is, whether it's trapping or furs, and I like that idea of for me, when, the, when fall comes around, it's harvest time. Bud also had another project going. He was writing a book, trying to bring together his own experiences and the stories he'd heard from old-timers and mountain men with this new idea of studying whole ecosystems instead of just individual parts. 
when I was working on the Loxhaw story in the 70s and 80s, the Rangers, a lot of them were saying, we can't, we can't sustain this. It wasn't anything new to the people out in the woods. Uh, I would say a primer to be real familiar with nowadays is, is Ehlers Koch's 40 Years of Forester. That takes you clear back to Pinchot's time. Ehlers um, committed suicide. I think a lot of things fell in on him. As I recall, I think he lost one of his sons. He had a, uh, a real problem with logging, and so and he was chief of opening the country up and logging, but then he couldn't hardly stand the aftermath of logging. That was in his dialogue, as I remember talking to him, and he just didn't feel good about what was happening. He was doing it, and he was doing it by the scientific methods, the things they knew at the time, but it didn't seem to be quite enough. It ought to be a better way. I, I feel intuitively that that was part of the big low that took him out. There's something for everybody on every acre. We just have to take care of that acre when we go in there grabbing stuff. If we go in hungry with big machinery and grab it all, we've killed everything else for a generation. In many areas, the agent of diversity is no longer fire anymore. It's logging. Just go look at the upper end of the Loxaw country. Cripes, fire, at any time in history has never modified the landscape like logging had. Look at the clear-cut areas all over. When we started uh, the effort to reintroduce grizzly bears into the Bitterroot, we needed some historical information about what went on in there a long time ago, and Bud had just written his book and it had a whole chapter on grizzly bears. He grew up in the Bitterroot, he ran sheep in the Bitterroot, he was there when the grizzly bear was shot by his dad. He talked about how everybody thought the mountains were full of grizzly bears and you know if we killed them on the edge there would still be grizzly bears all around and he brought that perspective that in fact the mountains weren't full of grizzly bears. He was the most superb and masterful woodsman I've ever known. I mean, he knew more about moving and tracking and trapping and living in the wilderness in the wintertime. I mean, he knew a tremendous amount. And that basic knowledge of, of wild country and wild animals was something that was really valuable to us. His knowledge of animals and the history of animals on the landscape and their use of different aspects and slopes and elevations and different seasons and seasonal movements I mean, he could go on for hours about that, and everybody would just be amazed at all the stuff he knew. You know, there's a guy that's gone from the utilitarian to the stewardship view just within his lifetime, and so he had tremendous credibility with a lot of people because of that. Bud's book came out in 1996. It took an honest look at what people have done to the land, but it was not a cry of despair. Typical of Bud, it was a proposal for doing better. We haven't gained anything in ability to see out there what's good. What we've gained is a whole lot of data detail. So much that you have to sort of push them out of the way, try to find the key nuggets in order to plan anything out here. You've got to go out there and figure out how it works and use what science we got, which is probably 10% of what you really would need to fully understand this thing. I respect science and think we ought to have it all in hand when we go out there best we can, boil down to something we can use. But then we know that's not going to be the whole story. There's an art there also. I like that, and that's why I'm here. That's why I put together some forest land so when I got uh, out of the forest service, I could still continue on there's some semblance of uh, what I like to do. These lands you look at right here probably have 10 times the mass than when I bought them, say, 25 years ago. But I've taken out lots of wood, and lots of wood for a lot of reasons. And we can do it and have a nice forest all around us all the time. We can do it anywhere we want to do it. But whether we will do it or not, that's up to the wishes of the people. Coyote Forest, you know, that's certainly one of the great highlights of my life.
Well, it's all action, all excitement, and uh, I'm getting a, a little bit hungry for more quiet time and time for creative thought. And I'd like to go back and revisit uh, some of the places where I worked uh, 60, 70 years ago. We thought we were saving the world, you know. The story, it's a pretty good one uh, from beginning to end. 